talked about an adolescent culture in the United States. We've also said something about those things which are important, almost essential, to most American youth. And now we move to a less pleasant topic, for here we begin to focus in on a particular segment of American youth. Not the kinds of youngsters you'll find in the suburbs, not the kinds of youngsters you'll find in fine restaurants, not the kinds of youngsters you'll find out shopping with their parents, but a group of youngsters who have come to be called the socially, economically disadvantaged, the economically deprived, the lower class, the poverty class. For our purposes, it would probably be best to refer to them as the socially alienated. The task and goal of the Job Corps is to take the socially alienated youth and to work with them so that they may in fact become responsible productive citizens. We turn now to a closer look at poverty in America. We take a closer look at the invisible American, the wasted American, who are white, who are Puerto Rican, who are Indian, youngsters who come from the large cities, from the west, from the rural areas of the south, from Appalachia. And although they come from different places and represent different backgrounds, they have one thing in common. They are at the bottom of the barrel. They are on the sidelines of American life. Poverty has no exclusive place. It can be found any place in America, in large metropolitan areas or in rural areas. Poverty does not know racial discrimination. It is, in fact, universal. It will strike the Negro as well as the Puerto Rican, the Protestant as well as the Catholic, the young, the old, the short, and the tall. None are spared the pain of poverty. Where do the poor live? In isolated places, behind buildings. Many of them have less room to live in than an abandoned junk car. Poverty can be found in rural areas where families live in quarters that are really unfit for any kind of human life. Some of the scenes you are seeing are difficult for some Americans to accept. There are places in America that we look at and we can't believe they exist. We think they're parts of war-torn Europe, perhaps the poor in India, but they are, in fact, America, and these are Americans. And in these kinds of surroundings, how can we, in fact, expect youngsters to be inspired, to be motivated, where, in fact, they see all about them rubble and ruin? Few of them have the opportunity to go beyond their own home. Here are pictures taken near a Cherokee reservation in North Carolina. The young man coming before you is undergoing one of the most humiliating experiences that any married male adult can undergo. He is seeking an unemployment check. No, sir. Wages. No, sir. Fully able to work? Yes, sir. In order to have his family survive, he has to go to the unemployment office. The society has pushed him aside. He no longer has the technical skills that are needed for entrance. But while the Cherokee Indian has been part of American life for over 200 years, many Indians in every part of America still stand on the sidelines and must, in fact, beg for food for survival. This gentleman here once had a farm, but because of technology, and rapid changes in agriculture, he was not able to compete with the total market. Most of these people didn't have a gift. My folks gave me a good farm. And all the sense I had was to farm. And I really farmed. You were able to make a living for your family? Yes. 
I raised three children, two of them stay. He has lost two sons. And now he is telling us that he wishes they would have had education, that if he would have had education, this perhaps would have made the difference. He is admitting personal failure. He is crying over his failure. And still he asks, give them a chance, give us a chance, and we can give something to the American society. Well, we have been talking then about a group called the Socially Alienated. They come from every part of America. The children come from a background of generations of poverty. Few around them represent success models. Many of them come from families where there has been no father. They have not been able to look to someone to take somebody's hand who has said to them, this is the way to success. This is the way to survival. Rather, all about them, the physical and the social dimensions of their lives represent poverty. Poverty of the generation. Why should this child be penalized because of her background? Why should any child be penalized because of the race of a parent or the ethnic origin of a parent? Each has an opportunity. Each should be given a chance. This elderly woman tells a tragic story of her son who is attempting to get through high school. Without financial assistance, he will drop out, and in the future he will become like this man, who now can no longer work his farm because of illness and because he lacks the technical skills. What kind of job do you think you'd like to have? But well, I haven't heard him say. Mm, you talked to him much about that? No. Uh, he, he wants him a good job, but I haven't heard him say. Mm -hmm. Did he talk anything about college at all? No, if I haven't heard him say about college, but I know he, he, ain't, he, knew he ain't gonna be able to go. Why? <laughs> May I ask you, how much schooling did you have? Oh, I went to the seventh grade. Seventh grade. How and about you, sir? Four. Four. I see. Well, I left school because I, my parents couldn't afford some school because they didn't have the money, so I stopped and got my job. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. you said that you didn't have what the other children, children had. had. No. Like what? Huh? What, what kinds of things did they have that you didn't? Well, clothes. And a lot of times I didn't even have money to pay them from a book, you know. And, uh, no, no, it's no. So I just started with the work. The socially alienated youth, then, represent a history and tradition of poverty. They are, in fact, the products of generations of poverty. Few of them have had experience with successful adult role models. When they look about them, they do not find fathers who represent success in business and industry. They do not have parents who have succeeded and have gone through the American educational system. Their lives are restricted to contact with but a few people, and unfortunately, few of these people have managed to enter and attain the good life. In attempting to work with these youth, we must keep this background in mind. For our purpose and our goal becomes the breaking of this endless chain so that the children of these youth might have known success, might have positive models to respond to. And at last, we may break the vicious cycle of poverty in the United States. The socially alienated, then, are youngsters who not only come out of poverty, but represent a tradition of being poor. Little in their life has indicated the good things. There has been little light, little music, little literature, little vacation. They are, in fact, a group of young people who have virtually lived and found themselves blocked in. The tall tenement buildings of New York City offer little light for somebody who finds himself quite small within that setting. The rural areas of the United States, the isolated places far out and far back, do not offer much in the way of inspiration. There are few poor youngsters who've ever been on a vacation. These are not the youngsters who find themselves in Disneyland or the World's Fair. These are the youngsters who the notion of a picnic a vacation, a Sunday outing, is a far-fetched idea. 
For all practical purposes, then, we have placed many American youth in a box. We have given them no exposure to the light of the outside. In fact, we have almost challenged them to find a way out without any assistance. The closed-in feeling, the restricted feeling, then, is one of the important characteristics of the socially alienated. Another important factor is that these youngsters come from families that have been socially disorganized. 40% of lower-class Negro youth come from broken homes without a father in the home. And in many cases, the mother has to work. And this is one of the reasons why the mother does not attend the PTA meetings. She's busy earning money so that her children can live. And when she doesn't show up for school, it isn't because she doesn't care. Rather, she may feel intimidated. She doesn't have the language and the skills of the middle class housewife. So again, the socially alienated find themselves deeper and deeper in the bottom of the barrel. They're closed in, they're restricted, there are a few role models for them, they represent generations of poverty, and on top of everything else is this, that were not enough. They come from families of disorganization. And finally, they come from backgrounds where there is not a father who is employed. Rather, they come from backgrounds where their parents are the last hired and the first fired. Why? Because they do not have the technical skills necessary for entrance and survival in a highly complex and technical society. These, then, are the characteristics of the socially alienated. From beginning to end, a sorry lot to have exist in the United States of America. The affluent society that has managed to shove and push and crush these youngsters. What about uh, the parents of these youngsters? Uh, do they also, do, do they do anything to ease the pressure? Oh, it depends uh, pretty much on the parent. Um, we feel in the high school that we're operating an open society type of thing where we want the parents to be interested in their children's welfare. We want the parents to come in and talk to us to give us a little bit of, of a keener perception so that we can understand the student better. Uh, we like the parents' involvement in the sense that they can help us. This teacher is from a high school in the suburbs of New York. He works with middle class youngsters. Um, the close tie between the parent and the student in a sense that uh, there is more of a parent-child uh, relationship as far as communication of ideas, uh, whereas in the lower socioeconomic groups, uh, uh, there isn't that type of communication. And I think this is the one of the missing links here. How about your parents? Do they help you with their No, I don't think so. Why not? Well, uh, they, they were out of school when they were young, they took around the fifth grade, so they were probably no one talking about. What about at home? Can your parents help you in the home? No, not at all. My father isn't living with us. Uh -huh. And my mother dropped, she, she's got, she got as far as the eighth grade. And I'm ahead of her. <laughs> what? I'm ahead of her. Oh, you're ahead of her now, so she can't. <clears throat> so she can't help me. And again, what they are requesting is some chance. And each, in fact, deserves the opportunity to make it, to attain the good life. I'd like to finish it, and I could go to college. Why do you want to go to college? Because I, be, I would like to become a teacher. Well, what kind of work do you think you'd like to do if you could? Engineer. Architect. Police work or, or, or something to do with animals. The plight of the socially alienated is at best, perhaps, portrayed, and quite tragically, in the eyes of these two young children. The picture you see before you is not posed. These are two children who are sitting in the steps of one of America's richest and largest cities. They are, unfortunately, typical examples of socially alienated youth. And while they are still very young, we can almost say with tragic accuracy that unless we intervene and make some significant difference in their lives, these youngsters will not succeed. These youngsters will not become part 
of American life. For to succeed with these youngsters, we must first break the tragic cycle and generations of poverty. We must break away the walls that surround them. We must expose them to the life and the light, the good life for which they are entitled. And while they are young, and while they do represent poverty, they have the same rights as any other youngster in America. They are not to be blamed. They are not to be ridiculed. They are not to be penalized because they have the misfortune to be born in poverty. Rather, it is our obligation and our responsibility to see to it that they do attain the good life for which every citizen in this country has a right to enter.